Amen. Thank you, Stephen. You all sound great today. Uh, don't you love Christmas? This is my favorite time of the year. I love everything about Christmas here at Park Cities. And thank you for everyone who helped decorate the entire church. We uh, had a big Deck the Halls event last week, and it was wonderful. Many of you were here on Thursday morning. You've already heard a little bit about it, but it was incredible. Blessing our city. I was able to be here as we uh, packed up all kinds of uh, food items for our Vickery friends. Uh, with Amin and others, a uh, group of you all heading out, and I was in cor- at Cornerstone as well. Just an amazing, amazing time. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I got a hunch your Thanksgiving didn't go exactly like you wanted it to. I'm just saying, we've got a lot of people who are sick, maybe burned the turkey, but that's kind of the way life goes, is what happens. Life is filled with disruptions. Uh, in fact, some can come in little small ways. Your, your life will be disrupted. This uh, coming week, you'll get a text you weren't expecting. You're going to get an email or phone call you didn't anticipate. Um, but some of us, uh, gosh, we've experienced some real challenging news um, in recent days, perhaps. Lots of mixed emotions during this time of the year. Last Sunday, some of you were with us. A lot of us um, fill in the chapel at our celebration of remembrance as we gather together. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God upon us that night, that afternoon, was palpable because we were together united in grief and loss. Life is often disrupted and this year perhaps you're experiencing Christmas without a loved one. Uh, We've got lots of mixed emotions this time of the year. Uh, Christmas is hitting a little bit differently for me. I see some of you who were with me in Israel just a few weeks ago. We were singing, come let us adore him in the church of nativity in Bethlehem. And so when I'm reading the text now, I'm seeing uh, the the topography. I'm I'm imagining across from Mount Carmel looking at Nazareth, a a town of about 77,000 people now. Scholars, a lot of commentators say about 500,000 people maybe at the time of Mary and Joseph when they were growing up there. But it hits differently too when you have a little grandson that's about six months old right now. And uh, many of you don't know that my son, Travis, his wife, Kate, is expecting in the spring. So we have a granddaughter who's coming into our family. So we've got a pregnant young mom. We've got a little baby that we're holding even this week. And and all of it comes together for me this year. And, And I know that, you know, we all have different stories because our lives are disrupted in good and not so good ways. Are you ready when life comes at you? and interrupts you because it, it'll happen again. And most of us have been alive long enough to know that life gets disrupted. And I, I wanna ask you, how do you deal with interruption in your life? How do you deal with disruption? And I want you to think about this, to apply this message to your life. I want you to think about how your life is being disrupted in these days. Maybe in good ways, bad ways, difficult ways. Maybe you're, you're living in a new place, got a new job. Maybe it's uh, a child that's soon to be heading off. What does it look like for you this year? Christmas is the announcement of the greatest disruption that we have ever known. The entire story as we knew it became a different story altogether. And we're gonna start today by looking each week at individuals whose lives were completely disrupted by Jesus and his coming. And we're gonna see how we can relate to them and how our lives too are disrupted. So I'll be here in the the sanctuary every week preaching through this series. And I hope, listen, I hope you'll be inviting friends to come join us. Because now's the time. That when's the last time you invited someone to come? Because at Christmas time, it's a simple ask to say, hey, I'm curious. Do you have anywhere to go, you know, to church this Christmas season? Because I'd love for you to come join me. And so let's invite friends to join as we proclaim the great news, the good news that disrupted all of our lives. So it all started with Mary. You can turn to Luke chapter one. And I'm going to set this up a little bit before we get to where you can... I mean, you can take notes throughout, but I'll, I'll lay out uh, the outline here in a moment. But I want us to look at Mary and really get to know, look and peek in to who uh, this young woman, likely teenager, was. Nathaniel expressed the common sentiment uh, of what people thought of Nazareth at the time when he asked 
the question, does anything good come out of Nazareth? When they had told him, the Savior, we found him. And he's from Nazareth. It's where he's growing up. It's where he's grown up. And, and we know now, much good can come out of Nazareth, right? Because God chooses lowly people, obscure places to do his best work. As you sort through your Christmas cards this month, and as you set up your nativity scene, Stacy and I are finally going to get to it this afternoon. We've got nativity scenes from all over the world. And something, a little, little hobby of mine, collect them from all over the world. But even as we set them up, we're going to see, you know, little, you know, Mary and, and the calm little, little holy family gather around. Probably, whole, you know, halos. That's how you know they're not shepherds or something. And, and we have little precious moments. They're there they're looking at baby Jesus. Even the angels kind of smiling. And not the kind of angel where we have to say, don't be afraid, like at all. Um, and and we, we have somehow uh, dis, you know, have this Mary. She's the most unruffled, calm, first-time mom ever, evidently. Uh, even the, the, you know, even the, the animals around are kind of smiling in the Christmas cards that we get. This pastoral, peaceful thing. Even the little drummer boy evidently can't wake Jesus up. And we sing, right, no crying he makes. And I think that the images, even in some of our carols, frankly, have betrayed what really took place on this first Christmas morning. Because when a, a raw reading of the text reveals complete disruption taking place in the lives of every person and its disruption to our world as we know it. And Luke allows us to get a picture into this. Some of this is inferred along the way, what we know about Mary and Joseph. But I want us to look at Mary as her life is completely turned upside down, as has been noted this morning. As a teenage girl, likely, not the kind of news you want to hear initially in a close-knit Jewish community that you're pregnant, out of wedlock. And so how does she respond to all this? Mary's introduced to us in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, uh, 27, where she's described as from Nazareth. It tells us a lot. Uh, she's a virgin. And she's engaged to be married. Gabriel has announced to Elizabeth, her older cousin, that she's miraculously pregnant. Commentators uh, believe she's likely to be 60 years old, maybe younger, maybe older but a much older cousin to Mary. And it says in verse 28, the angel went to her, to Mary, and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Highly favored. The word is graced. Grace upon you. You've been chosen, is what he's saying. Mary was greatly troubled, greatly disturbed. I'm sure terrified at his words. And look at, notice, his words, oddly, all angels are actually men or male in the Bible. Um, I don't know if we add angels as women because there aren't, but there's but one woman in the entire story. But here we see that the angel Gabriel is here and, and he says, uh, he's troubled. It says he's troubled from his, by his words. By the way, angels always speaking for God. Okay, so this is God speaking in a form that she can hear and understand and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. What is happening? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Number one command in all of scripture, by the way, Mary, you have found favor. You, there's the word again. You've been graced with God. You found favor with God, graced by God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call. You're to call his name Yeshua. God saves and it says then, he'll be great, called the son of the most high. And the Lord will, will give the throne of his father, father David, forever. And his kingdom, of his kingdom there'll be no end. Clear references to Jesus as the Messiah. Mary would have known this. Mary's life, her entire story is disrupted. What's happening here is that she is, is being asked to join the big story. God's story, her little story, that she would join what God is up to. She asked the obvious question in verse 34, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And then he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The language there is, will overwhelm you, will supersede you. And then it says, the Most High will overshadow you, will overtake you like a cloud. The angel is saying, your story, Mary, just got hijacked 
by God Almighty because he has found favor with you. Listen, here, here's the entire story wrapped up in this single verse. Luke 1, 37. For nothing is impossible for God. Elizabeth is pregnant. You're now pregnant. She's in her sixth month. You're now pregnant. Mary's life is completely disrupted. You're now going to abandon your story and join the one that's already going on. Her story is our story. Because the same big story, capital S story, is the one that God's inviting you in today. Jesus issues an invitation. This is what Christmas means. To abandon your little story where you will lose yourself in your little story to join him in the big story where you find yourself. See, many people are living pseudo lives with false stories because all of life is a story. What you think the story is guides everything about your life. Where you think your story's heading guides every decision and every way you respond to disruptions that come in and out of your life. So are you living in light of the big story? The German theologians called it Heil Geschichte, the, re the redemptive story of God. The salvation story with Jesus at the center. And it says in verse 39, it says that she quickly went to the hill country into a town of Judah. Many believe this is Hebron. Now, commentators think that it's likely Hebron because we do know that this is where likely Zechariah is living. It's about 80 miles from Nazareth. Think about this. I think we have a desperate teenage girl who discovers she's pregnant in a close-knit Jewish community, she is desperate to find someone that she can tell and talk to. She thinks about her godly, spirit-filled cousin, Elizabeth. She's seeking refuge. Could it be that she travels all that way, which would have been quite a journey? And no one else is mentioned. Did she do it alone? We're not certain. She may have just rolled her sleeves up and says, I am going because I need to find refuge. I need to speak with someone. She goes to Hebron. Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, was an older priest, likely living in this ironic priestly town, then accomplishing his priestly duties in Jerusalem, not too far away. Elizabeth is, is Mary's older cousin. Again, she's godly, a godly, righteous woman. This is, it speaks a lot about this family. And, and, and I must point out, the encounter that they have when Mary arrives. You see in verse 41, it says, Elizabeth's baby leapt in her womb upon the arrival of Mary with Jesus in her womb. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, connected miraculously in a, in a mysterious way to her son who is also filled with the Spirit. It says in chapter one, verse 13, even in his womb, in the womb, her womb. And Elizabeth is on fire. This woman is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she says, you are blessed with the Messiah. Look at this. The mother of my Lord, she calls him. Now think about this. Mary, an excited, nervous, first-time mother in a close-knit Jewish community, goes to find a woman who will come alongside her. She didn't choose to be pregnant. You could say, this is an unwanted pregnancy. At least unexpected initially. This is a desperate teenager traveling 80 miles to find someone that would understand, understand her predicament and find, and find hope and, and encouragement. The younger Mary needs guidance from an older woman. This is so true today. We need godly women speaking in the lives of young women. We need godly men who are speaking into the lives of young adults and young men. We need women who will find a safe haven with other women when they're seeking guidance. And Mary finds nothing but encouragement from Elizabeth. Think about this. This is a rare conversation between two women in Scripture. Mary only finds, no competition, only blessing and encouragement. And don't miss this. The first one to recognize Jesus' arrival is an unborn baby in utero. And now, now Elizabeth, the first one to proclaim out loud 
that Jesus has arrived, the coming of the Savior, is an older woman filled with the Holy Spirit. This speaks volumes to what God is up to, even in our day. And then it says in chapter 1, verse 45, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Look at this. Don't miss this. Mary is called blessed, not simply because she's the mother of Jesus. She's, called, she's blessed. Here's why. Because you have believed that what God said is going to happen is going to happen. Mary is marked by humility. That's why God chose her. And she believes. What did Mary believe? I say all this because I'm fascinated by that story of these two women. But it's also to set up. What, what did she, Mary, what did you know? What did Mary know? She, she knew a lot. And we see it in the Magnificat. Okay? So she knew baby Jesus. Think about this. She knew the boy Jesus. She knew the baby Jesus. Like no one else. Like any mom. She knew the son. Jesus, growing up, she knew him as a teenager. She knew him as a young man. She knew Jesus more than anyone on the planet. She knew him better than anyone, ultimately. And it's because she just said, I believe. And I'm challenging all of us this Christmas season, friends. I'm just challenging you. Here it is. Believe. And you can pray the prayer with me. Lord, I believe. Like the, like the, the, the man whose, whose son was healed. Help me with my unbelief. Because listen, it's not, it's not just your belief that matters. It's not the amount of your faith. It's the object of your faith. Mary trusts in God because she knew, watch this, she knows who God is. She knows what he's up to in the world. So Mary, what did you believe? We see it in the Magnificat, which is Latin for magnify. Look at chapter 1, verse 46. This will serve as really the, 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 the outline now from this, this, this point on. In the message. And here's what I want you to see. First of all, we, we're going to replace your, your worry with worship. That's what Mary does. Look at this. Verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, look, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Three ways I want you to see that, that, that we can respond to interruptions. Again, consider a disruption in your life right now. Number one, replace your worry with worship. Listen, look, Mary magnifies the Lord. This is like a magnifying glass. You, you can't make him bigger than he is, but you can glorify. That's the other, other translation. The more you worry, the greater, the bigger your worries become. When you magnify your worries, then your worship decreases. When you magnify the Lord, you focus on him and who he is and what he's done. Your worries diminish. When we magnify God, our worries are minimized. Where's your focus these days? And, and why are you worrying so much? Why so much anxiety? What are you putting into your mind? Because a lot of us are putting all the worries and troubles of the world into our minds when we should be magnifying something else, someone else. The more you worship, the more your problems are minimized. This hit me this week. Why wouldn't we all be running to church on Sunday mornings? If this is true, that we come together encouraging each other, loving the Lord, exalting his name, glorifying him, and our problems are diminished. Because they are dominated by the fact that our God is all powerful. No wonder we teach our kids, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Friends, some of you need to hear this today. It's wrapped up in verse 37. There is nothing impossible for God. And we need to focus on him so that our worries will decrease as our worship increases. Our, uh, of course, this demands that we, like Mary, become humble. This is, our pro this is our problem. It's pride. We've got to believe that God is present and that he is already at work in the world. This is why Mary is chosen. She says what we all need to hear. In, in essence, her posture, Lord, I'm not in charge. 
Friend, you're not in charge of your life. You don't know what's coming. We need to humble ourselves like Mary and say, I'm your servant. Do with me what you want. Interrupt my life. Disrupt my life. Mary, what did you know? Look at verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Charlotte read it earlier. We, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Wow. What is she talking about? Rulers being taken down? The the wealthy being brought down? The, The humble and the hungry raised up and fed and filled? Look at this. Secondly, Replace your plans with God's promises. This is what she's doing. When we replace God's plans with our promises, the result is peace. But this demands an interruption. Most often, many of us are not experiencing peace in our lives precisely because we've not allowed God to intervene and disrupt our own plans. So there's anxiety and tension because you're battling God. You've got the steering wheel, if you will. This is my plan. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm up to. And God is calling you out. He's saying, join me. Many people grow bitter and upset. We even personify our our challenges and our anxiety and our anger in other people when God is saying, no, 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 I'm sovereign over your life. You need to understand this disruption will ultimately lead to peace if you join me. We've said it before, we often ask, what is God's will for my life? Many people spend years asking that question. When God is waiting on you to join what he's already doing in the world. Mary knows exactly what's happening in the world. She knows the big story. Do you know the big salvation story that he's asking all of us to be a part of? The better question is what is God's will? Full stop. What is he up to in the world and and how can I join him? Many, listen, many of us, we're wondering, what what do I do? What what does God want me to do? Does he want me to join the church? Should I join a connect group or like get involved in in grow classes or should I serve somebody or love a neighbor or coworker? What what should I do? Lord, tell me what. And the Lord's waiting on you. He's already told us what to do. Mary knew exactly what was going on. How in the world, I'm fascinated by this. How in the world does a teenage girl articulate the redemptive story of God with such incredible faith, living out in the middle of nowhere in an obscure little town? How in the world does she know what's going on? There's only one answer. It speaks of her parents And her community of faith around her pouring into her life, her passion for God's word. She's a teenager on fire because her mind is filled with the word of God. She didn't have screens, didn't have the internet, didn't have movies, all the things. Commentators note, this sounds like a psalm. And they name the, you know, how many of them it sounds like. In fact, seven different Old Testament books are referenced in her short praise and psalm to the Lord. I mean, think about it. Like today, if a, little, if a teenage girl were to sit down, write a song, write some poetry, she'd probably model it after her favorite artist, you know, Taylor Swift or somebody, right? Mary is writing like a song. She's just emulating what she already knows and what God is up to in the world. So my question for all this, not just our teenagers, but young people here, do you know God's word? You can be just like Mary. Because your life is going to be disrupted. Parents, are you teaching your kids? Church family, are we pouring into young women and young men to say, your life's going to get interrupted. If it hasn't already, it's going to get hijacked. And are you ready for that? And the only way we can be ready is to understand the big story of God, what he's already doing in the world. Do you know it? And are you willing to join him? See, we're to to replace our worry with worship. It's the only way we overcome worry is to magnify him. And we are to replace our little plans that we get lost in with his big plan where we find ourselves. 
And finally, we replace our ability, play, replace your ability with, his, with, with your availability. That, that's all that Mary did. She just made herself available. She didn't have any great gifts or, or something to bring, it doesn't seem. Look at verse 54. It's all wrapped up in community as well. She's not thinking about herself. Look at this. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his, his offspring forever. And Mary reminded, uh, remained with her, that's Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her home. And no wonder she stayed with Elizabeth in this first trimester. She was there being encouraged, being loved. Friends, are you gonna allow your life to be disrupted? And this month, are you going to look for people in need? Are you gonna point them to Jesus? What is God calling you to do? Because here's what Mary is, she's singing, she's singing this. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my savior all the day long. Can you join her by singing with your life? My soul rejoices in God, my savior. That's what my life is all about. She knew that only Jesus could save us. We need a savior. And we know that Mary's baby did grow up. In fact, just eight days later, they go to the Temple Mount where a group of us, where I was teaching on the temple steps leading up from the south into the temple. She, they walk this area where we were just a few weeks ago. They bring the baby there like we do, dedicating Jesus before the Lord. And it's there that Simeon, the old man who had prayed that he'd see the Savior, he then offers the foreboding warning to young first-time mom, Mary. And he says, a sword's going to pierce your heart too. And she would watch her son grow up, move from, from Nazareth to a little region called Galilee, just north of the Sea of Galilee, where he'd spend much of his time in ministry. He would end up in Jerusalem. And there he would end up there one last time where Mary would watch her little boy die on a cross at a young age. And she would watch in horror as her son would die before her, for her and for us. And all of it made sense in a way that she could never have dreamed that we now embody the mission of Jesus to bring hope, to bring justice to the world in every space we find ourselves in, to bring hope. Because his story is history. And listen, it's not simply being pushed from the past or engineered in the present. It's being pulled from the future into what God has already ordained and what he's already established. And we know, friend, that we will overcome the enemy. We will overcome the enemy someday as we're pulled into eternity. It says in Revelation 12, 11, and they have, over, they have conquered him, the enemy, the evil one, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. This is Mary. We can all trust in the blood of the lamb who has taken away our sin. And this is our testimony. This is our song. That Christ has forgiven us. That he has disrupted our lives completely. And we will join him in what he's doing. Your life has been disrupted. Have you responded to him? And how is he calling you to respond to him today? Friend, listen, you can replace your worry with worship. You can replace your little plans with his eternal plan. And you can get on board and decide in what ways you're going to do that today. For some of you, it might be joining the church. It may be receiving Christ today. You've not done that. You're not clear on that. It may be as bold and courageous as talking to someone after this service or this week. Or talk to someone that you're with to share how is God disrupting your life in all the right ways. And you can replace your ability, or lack thereof, with a simple availability. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. And you watch what he does. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this amazing woman the story of this young woman that you chose that we would know nothing about unless you chose her. Lord, you're choosing us today and we respond to you with obedience. Lord, I pray that every one of us 
will decide exactly how we're going to respond. And let us first tell someone. Let us share how you've interrupted our lives. And we will say yes to you. Whatever it costs. Because we love you more than our own lives. Lord, help us not to waste our lives. With the days that we have remaining on this planet. That we would live out the story that you've already begun. And we'll find our place in it. And in so doing, find ourselves and what you've created us to be and to do. May this be the greatest Christmas we've ever known. May we be bold in our testimony that Jesus alone saves. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen and amen. Hey.